I'm Peter. All right, hello everybody. Um, while we're going through the, the presentation today, I get you to all pop yourselves on mute. Um, we're going to be recording today's presentation as well for those that can't make it. Uh, and then we will have questions um, after each presentation. So um, hello, my name's Katie Ronald. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the National Volunteer Program Coordinator for Bush Heritage. And I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of our country throughout Australia and recognise their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. Uh, we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, emerging and to any First Nations people who might be joining us today. For me, I would like to acknowledge the Wadjuk people of Noongar Buja, where I'm joining you from in Perth. And if you would like to acknowledge the country you're on, please feel free to put it in the chat. So today I'm excited to have two presentations from uh, two of our colleagues, um, <coughs> Dean Gilligan and Tegan oh, Peterson. Hold on. Um, I've got a very short update on the volunteer program before we jump into those presentations. Okay. So um, just to let you guys know, we've had some updates to our COVID vaccination guidelines. So we're going to be sending that full update out later this week, but we've just made some changes in alignment with the changes that other states have had to workers and vaccination requirements. So proof of vaccination will now only be required if workers are going to be working alongside COVID vulnerable communities or COVID vulnerable individuals. Um, and that requirement will be outlined in each volunteer job description. So we'll send more details through to that later in the week. Um, I also wanted to provide a quick update on the survey results. So October last year, feels like a long time ago, almost a year ago, um, we held our biennial volunteer and staff survey of the volunteer program. Um, the results were analysed over summer and we did use those results to implement our work plan for the next two years. We did that over February um, and we're currently working on kind of a, a visual way to get those results out to you guys so that it's easy to read and nice to see and easy to consume. So that's uh, being worked on at the moment by our communication and marketing team. So we'll hopefully get that out to you guys soon. And I've also got a last piece of exciting news as well. Uh, Michelle Stook is back with Bush Heritage as well. So um, she had a secondment to Bird Life Australia. Um, for those that you that might be new to the program, uh, Michelle was the national program coordinator for six years before I was. Um, and she's now leading a new program called Seeding the Future, um, which is managing all of our interns and student placements and also encompasses a mentoring side and element to that program as well. So they're really supported in their roles. Um, so she's started that already. Um, she was hoping to come along today, but unfortunately she's had another commitment come up. Uh, but she's very keen to jump onto another one of these sessions later in the year to see you all again. So um, our first talker today is Dean, our freshwater and wetlands ecologist. Um, and he's going to be talking to you a bit about a project he's been working on and where he might need volunteers in the future. So any questions that you've got through, for Dean throughout his presentation, please put them in the chat and we will get to them afterwards. Um, or you can come off mute at the end of the preso and ask him yourself. So Dean, over to you. Right. Just do a screen share thing. That's the one there. Okay, so I'm calling in from Ngunnawal country, which is Canberra. I'm up here for a meeting about the Scott Star Reserve Evaluation Plan, but everything I'm talking about is at our Edgebaston Reserve, which is on Bidjara country in central Queensland. So Edgebaston is in the Mitchell Grass Downs priority landscape. So the highest ecological value that we're supposed to recover for that Priority landscape is obviously the Mitchell grasslands. Um, Edgebaston is right on the border of the Mitchell grasses, but we've got around about 350 hectares of pretty healthy Mitchell grass, grasslands on the reserve, which are a really awesome habitat to work in for me, given that I'm an aquatic ecologist and I really don't stay dry all that often. It's really nice to get opportunities to work in terrestrial habitats. But the crown jewel of Edgebaston Reserve isn't the Mitchell Grass Downs, it's the Great Artesian Basin Springs um, that are part of the Pelican Creek Spring Cluster. Um, most of the springs in that cluster are contained within Edgebaston Reserve, but our neighbours to the south and the east also have a small number of springs on their properties as well. Um, 
In the mid 80s, a researcher called Winston Ponder, who's a malacologist studying invertebrates, um, stumbled upon the springs and catalogued that at that time, they were the most biologically important spring complex on the planet in terms of the number of endemic plant and animals that it supported. Um, we've since been superseded by another spring complex in Chile, um, but we're dis re disregarding that. The springs are really important. They're listed as a critically endangered ecological community nationally. Um, and uh, springs on Edge Bastion have a whole suite of plants and animals that are found nowhere else on the planet. The star of that group of animals is obviously the red fin blue eye, which I'll talk about a lot during this presentation, but there's more than just blue eyes in the springs. The blue eye, the little yellow and blue fish you can see swimming around on the screen, they're juvenile blue eyes. They haven't yet developed the red fins that the adult males get. The other fish that you can see, the chubby little pale ones that are skipping around on the bottom, they're our edge baston gobies. They're also almost entirely restricted to edge baston, although there's a couple of populations um, on Moro Station to our south and another population in the Aramac, which is about 30 kilometres as the crow flies south of Edgy. But most of the populations of both of those species of fish only occur on edge baston, and for the blue eye, its total population is on edge baston but it's not just the fish. If you look closely at this little clump of algae, you can see a little shrimp hanging off it. There's another one here. That shrimp is almost endemic to Edge Baston, found nowhere else. Every one of these little black specks crawling around on the bottom, they're one of the eight or nine species of endemic snail that are restricted just to Edge Baston. Uh, and in addition to that, we've got dragonflies, spiders, and a whole suite of about a dozen plants that are only found in the Pelican Springs uh, complex or on, only on Edge Bastion itself. So these springs are really biologically significant places. But focusing in on our blue eye, they were only discovered for the first time in the early 90s. So um, a friend of mine, Peter Unmack, was a young guy at the time, was interested in Winston's finding that there was this super diverse cluster of springs somewhere near Aramac. So Peter um, went up and had a look and sampled some fish from the springs and lo and behold discovered the existence of a fish that nobody even knew existed at all. Its next most closely related species is another blue eye that lives in the estuaries of the Gulf of Carpentaria. So these things are out on a really long evolutionary limb. Uh, and a really unique species. The gobies are a little bit different in that pretty much every spring complex in the Lake Air Basin has its own characteristic goby species, but they're all pretty similar. But the blue eye is really unique. So after it was discovered in the 90s, they went around and surveyed a number of the springs on what was then Edge Baston Station. So each of the little blue dots on the map is the location of a, a Great Artesian Basin spring. And they found that redfin blue eye were present in nine of the springs on the reserve. Um, but two of those locations were kind of intermittent springs that were right next door to a permanent one that dried out occasionally. And sometimes it was, had water in it and fish populated it, but most of the time it was dry. So it was really only seven populations of redfin blue eye at the time that the species was discovered. At about the same time as that discovery, this fish invaded the spring complex. Um, it's called the Eastern Gambusia or the mosquito fish. They were introduced to Australia from uh, Southeast uh, USA around the Everglades in the 1920s as a mosquito control by control. Totally unnecessary exercise in that pretty much every native fish eats mosquitoes as well, but they did it and now we're stuck with them. They're one of the most invasive freshwater fish on the planet. Um, they cause problems in almost every country they're introduced to. Um, and those problems arise from the fact that they're bullies. Um, they do nip the fins of tadpoles and native fish. They do eat the eggs and larvae of native fish. But in, in the context of the blue eyes, what they do for our blue eyes is that they exclude them from the deeper, more permanent, um, good water quality sections of springs and relegate them to the margins in the periphery where the water quality is more extreme and the fish have a bit more physiological stress than they would otherwise. 
But the history is that wherever these things have turned up, the blue eyes have usually disappeared within a year. So this is the map of where they're currently found on Edgebaston Reserve. So the big circles are the really abundant populations. And as the circle gets smaller, that reflects a smaller population. Um, and the little blue circle, the tiny blue circles are the springs that there's no fish in at all. So pretty much at this point in time, Gambusia have invaded every spring on the reserve that's capable of supporting a fish population. And they continue to spread. So over the last three years, they've turned up in six new springs that they weren't in before. So that's the major threatening process to the blue eyes that we have to manage. So Bush Heritage took over management of Edge Baston Reserve um, in 2009. And by that stage, we'd lost um, five of the original populations. So the, the little cluster of springs up here that had them, they've now disappeared from, they've disappeared from the spring cluster down here. Um, and the only two they're left in is the two pairs that I mentioned earlier, the permanent one and the intermittent spring next door. So really we only had two populations. And of those two, within a couple of years of Edge Baston becoming a Bush Heritage Reserve, we lost this one here in Northwest 90. And we were left with one natural endemic population left. And that spring is called type locality. Um, it's the spring where the fish were first discovered. Um, I'll move on from there. Okay, so the first aquatic ecologist that Bush Heritage employed to manage the recovery plan was Adam Carezzi. He didn't really engage with volunteers all that much, um, but what he did do was start the first translocation. So we had one uh, endemic natural population left. He caught some individuals from that population and translocated them into a bunch of other springs on the reserve. It was about six that he did that. The springs he chose were springs that were isolated in the landscape and therefore hard for Gambusia to invade. But that also meant that they were kind of on the periphery of the, the spring complex and they were quite small and their water supply was a bit tenuous. So most of those early attempts failed because the spring dried out. The only successful translocation that Adam managed were in springs that were closer to the central spring clusters. But in order to do that, he had to build a fence around the spring to exclude Gambusia. And the fences that Adam built on his own were what you can see in the picture, basically just standard shade cloth from the hardware, um, stapled to a bunch of timber pegs that encircled the spring. Um, and they worked, as I said, at least two of his translocations um, established in springs that Adam had created these exclusion barriers around. So um, that was our first step forward in blue eye recovery. Problem with Adam's fences is that they just weren't robust or resilient. They degraded within a couple of years, they started to fall apart and then Gambusia started to invade the springs that Adam had, had fenced off. The other issue was that the springs were all really small. He chose the easy ones to deal with the very small, um, sparsely vegetated springs. Um, the downside of that strategy, they're easy to cope with, but the downside is that they had a relatively small carrying capacity. So while he created new populations of blue eyes, the number of individuals in each population was still kind of small. So it was a baby step forward. Along came, uh, came uh, Rob Wager, who was Adam's um, successor. Rob came up with a much more robust, resilient fence design um, with UV stabilized shade cloth, with steel pegs and posts. And these things have done a fantastic job. And the ones that were installed in 2016 are pretty much all still standing and functioning today. The downside is that they're really hard to put in and that's where volunteer support for Edgebaston Reserve and the recovery plan came into action. So we've had loads of volunteer crews come out to help us build these Cambusia exclusion fences on the reserves. We've had traditional owner groups and uh, Indigenous ranger groups come out. We've had the Australian New Guinea Fishers Association has sent groups of members out to help us build fences, or we've had general volunteer support from Bush Heritage volunteers. Um, and the process is the top photo on the left is we had to pull out the, what was left of Adam's original fences. We had to hammer steel strainer posts into what can sometimes be very, very rocky ground. 
and dig trenches where we could bury the apron of the mesh underground so that Gambusia couldn't get under the fences during floods. Uh, then you pin, oop, sorry, I'll go back. You pin the shade cloth, which is UV stabilized shade cloth, 95% shade. So we've got a, a small aperture that baby Gambusia can't swim through. Uh, and then you have to backfill the trench with a lot of manual labor. So it's hard work, but it's rewarding work and it's resulting in positive outcomes for uh, redfin and for edge bass and gobies that are persisting through till today. So where are our fences now? We've got, uh, I've got, I've got to shift something on my screen. Okay, we've got 13 fences installed. We started building them in 2016 and we're still building them in 2022. Those 13 fences uh, encircle 16 springs. Um, in total, we've got 3.6 kilometres of fence and they fence in 8.4 hectares and it's taken us 92 volunteers um, usually spending a week long each to, to help us build those fences. Um, it's a moving target though. A lot of the earlier fences, oh, I'll go back. A lot of the earlier fences were these very small, I uh, say so the fences are the little red polygons. A lot of the fences that got built in the early days were quite small, about the size of a living room or a very small backyard. But what we're moving towards now is trying to get a bigger bite of the cherry by choosing larger springs that have a much greater carrying capacity. So if we're successful in fence, excluding the Gambusia uh, and we can get populations of redfin blue eye established, we're gonna recover thousands of individuals as opposed to a few dozen to a few hundred individuals. So a very big outcome. But because of the scale is going up, the workload is also going up. So as I said, we used to deal with springs that were about the size of a kitchen or a dining room. Now we're talking about several tennis courts, if not football field size springs. Um, and one of the biggest challenges with dealing with springs at that scale is how you manage the vegetation. So the first step is you have to fence the spring to exclude Gambusia from getting there. Um, as I said, there's pretty much no springs left that don't have Gambusia in them already. So the springs that we choose to recover blue eyes in, we've got to eradicate the Gambusia first. And the process that we follow to, the, to achieve that eradication is basically, you've got to limit the amount of vegetation on the water surface. So you can pretty much see every residual bit of water within the spring area, because a Gambusia can persist in a little pool of water the size of a footprint. So you really need to be able to identify every bit of surface water in the spring. Um, Pippa Kern, who was my predecessor, started using brush cutters and, and rakes and um, blowers to control vegetation. Uh, and as I said, that's totally reasonable to do in anything up to the size of a backyard, but it comes much more challenging when you're dealing with a football field. Um, but that's part of the process that I work with the volunteers on when we fence the spring, the first step is to go in and remove as much of that surface vegetation as we can to expose that surface water. But what we're trialed this year, which we haven't done in the past, is using fire controlled burns to actually reduce the amount of dry, sort of thatchy tussock vegetation in the spring. We burn it off first, and then we only have to brush cut the green vegetation that's left around the periphery of the water. Nobody, nobody in Queensland has used fire to manage vegetations in springs before, but there's lots of precedents from overseas and particularly case studies from Lake Air Basin Springs in South Australia, where they've demonstrated that spring vegetation actually likes fire. A lot of the endemic plants are shaded out by the very dense groves of Kambungi or Phragmites or tussock grasses. When you burn that vegetation off, it allows the smaller endemic plants to access the light and they've really flourished as a result of burning off that uh, older coarse vegetation. But that's only a secondary benefit. The real benefit for us is it exposes that surface water. The next step in the process, this could be a bit distressing to see because we actually go in with a lot of force. You need to create an immense amount of disturbance in the spring in order to get the Gambusia out. What I want to reinforce is that these springs recover from this level of disturbance. They recover from the fire, they recover from the slashing. 
when we pump out a spring, typically it refills within 24 hours. So there's a short term disturbances that they do recover from. And, but we've got to maintain that we're looking for the end goal of getting the gambrugia out so that we can get the redfin blue eyes and the gobies back in. But anyway, what we do, I call this mud pumping. We've got, and now we've got a sullage pump, which is fantastic. You dig a small pit in one of the deeper areas of the spring. Within 20 minutes to half an hour, that sullage pump pumps out the majority of the water and you're left with a much smaller residual puddle within the spring that we have to treat with the next stage of the gambrugia treatment which is the uh, rotenone poisoning. So again, this part of the activity, volunteer support is really, really critical, but it's very dirty. Okay, final step, second final step. And Stephanie, there you are. You managed to get a showing. Um, we need to apply the, the rotenone. Rotenone is the powdered dust of a pea plant from Southeast Asia. Um, it's, so it's an organic, um, Pesticide, it's exactly the same stuff that people put on their vegetables in the backyard, totally non-toxic to, to mammals. Um, its target organisms are insects on your vegetables, but a bycatch of rope known as fish are extremely susceptible to it. So the blue coloration is the marker dye. That's simply to let us know that we've sprayed all of the surface water within the spring. But once you apply the toxin, uh, you can see in the video on the right, you can see the gambusia within minutes of applying the toxin have swum to the surface. The reason they do that is that the rotenone blocks the physiological processing of oxygen. So it doesn't actually strip anything from the water, but it eliminates the ability of the fish to transfer oxygen across their gill membrane. So effectively they suffocate. And if they're exposed to our target concentration for more than five minutes, most of the fish will die in a very short period of time. But what we've learned through applying this process over and over and again at Edgebaston is that typically there'll always be some survivors in the population for a single treatment. And quite often you have to repeat the treatment a couple of times in succession before you get the outcome that we're after, which is gambusia eradication. Um, so again, volunteers are critical to this process of spraying. Again, very small spring, it's easy. You can spray a spring in 10 minutes, no troubles whatsoever. But when you've got to try and spray every bit of surface water in a spring the size of a football field, it's a big job. And what we're after, the end result is a spring where the rope known is dissipated from the water. That typically happens within a week. Um, the vegetation has started to regrow. The spring has recharged. Most of the shrimps and snails and endemic fauna have survived the treatment process. Um, we do acknowledge that it's probably gonna knock off quite a few of the insects because they're the arthropods that known is targeted towards, but importantly, there shouldn't be any fish in the spring. So once we've treated it, um, the reserve manager and myself will monitor the spring for six months. And if we don't detect any fish or gambusia in particular, for a six month period. And that'll be topped off with a new bit of kit I've just ordered, which is an eDNA sampler. Uh, and we've confirmed that there's no gambusia left. And then we can go to the last step in the process, which is reintroducing redfin blue eye. So it's either introducing or reintroducing because some of the springs we're treating, there's never been a record of blue eyes in the past, but it's an excellent spring with great habitat, a huge gambusia biomass, Therefore, if we can eliminate the gambusia, it's going to be great habitat for blue eyes. Or we're trying to get blue eyes back into a spring where they occurred formerly. I call them the original seven, and they've been extinct since gambusia invaded. But basically, that activity involves walking around in the spring with a tiny little cutoff bottle as a scoop or a little aquarium net. You can see Simone Yasui holding in the middle photo, catching 10 redfin blue eye from each of the springs that exist and then introducing them into a, a newly treated, renovated spring that's gambusia free and ready to support blue eyes. So in terms of the outcomes, which is what you guys are interested in learning about, how much difference has all this fencing and gambusia eradication made? Uh, I've got a plot there on the left of the number of populations that have existed through time since the species was discovered. So there are about six to seven populations initially. We lost some, we gained some as those intermittent springs dried out. About this time, Gambusia showed up and we lost almost all of our populations bar two. 
in at, at that time in 1997 there was very little monitoring undertaken of how many populations were left so we assumed just those two survived through until bush heritage took over in 2009 that's when adam started his translocation the population jumped up to eight we lost a couple uh, we gained a few more we lost a couple more and then it stabilized and what i hope we're on now is the cusp of a new upturn where we're starting to fence off a lot more springs and we're going to go through the roof and meet our management plan target, which is 13 springs. But I've got my fingers crossed that by the end of the year, we'll have Blue Eyes back in 19 springs on Edge Basin Reserve, which is far larger than even the number of populations that existed when they were discovered. So the, oh, I'll go back. Those icons you can see on the map, oh, I've got to get rid of this pane so I can see it. Right. The symbols mean, so red is a natural population. They've always been there. They never went extinct. The blue circles are springs that we uh, populated from translocation of blue eyes from the red springs into the newly rehabilitated ones. And in most cases, the blue ones were ones that were Gambusia free before we started working on them. The green ones were populations that have been recreated from a combination of translocated wild fish plus our captive red blue eyes from the captive breeding population. And the little black circles with the yellow cross are the populations that we're working on, or the springs that we're working on now that within the next 12 months, we hope to have treated and have blue eye populations in. Dean? Yep. It's Leanne, mate. Can I just jump in? There's a couple of questions building up in the chat that you probably can't yeah. see. Makes I sense can't. to no, <laughs> makes sense to answer them before we move on. So yeah. Kat Hudson had a question with regarding the captive breeding population. You probably get to talk about that, I'm guessing, but uh, she asks, is there any captive breeding populations that can be reintroduced later in case of a wild population decline? Yep, I'll get to that one in a couple of slides. Cool. And then the other question that I couldn't answer um, was with regards to the invertebrates that feed the fish and how they respond to the uh, rhodonone treatment. Okay, I'll get to that one too. Cool. Okay. All right. So we can't continue to do this spring fencing activity. Generally, Bush Heritage is hesitant to use fences as a management tool. But in the case of Redfin Blue Eye and Gambusia, it's an essential component. If we didn't build fences, we simply wouldn't have redfin blue eye. But we can't keep building forever. So when do we stop? Um, I would recommend that we, we've got two more fences that we need to build as part of our current threatened species action plan strategy. We got 200,000 from the federal government to, uh, we call it the Gambusia Blitz, 2022 Gambusia Blitz. That's what I'm engaging a lot of volunteer support for at the moment. Uh, I want to get that project finished. So we need two more for that. The next cab off the rank is that I would like to be able to stand up and say we've recovered blue white populations in all seven or nine of the original locations they were in when they were discovered. And in order to achieve that goal, that would mean we add two more. Um, I think that would probably do us in terms of our fence building and we won't need to build any additional new fences after we achieve those two goals. But what we do have to plan for is that the shade cloth only has a guaranteed shelf life of 10 years of exposure to UV. So we need to plan into the future for a program of pulling out the old shade cloth and replacing it with new shade cloth, but doing it in a way that we don't let Cambogia invade the spring while we're doing it. So that's going to keep us very, very busy from 2026 onwards. Uh, and then the fourth dot point I've got in terms of ongoing is we've done all this work badged towards Redfin Blue Eye. We've also got the Edge Baston Gobi, which has received very little management attention. And before the end of this year, I think Redfin Blue Eye are going to be in a better conservation position than, than Gobies are. So we'll have to switch our focus to do a little bit more work on Gobies than we have in the past. That might simply be introducing Gobi populations into some of the springs we've already fenced or it might mean that we have to choose some additional springs that suit gobies more and fence a few just for gobies benefit. But there's a lot more fencing to do. So that wraps up the main part of my talk, which is about what I'm really busy with over the next 12 months and what I've used volunteers for in the last few months. Um, 
But I'll move forward and skip through some of the other opportunities we've got for engaging with volunteers at Edge Baston. And if anything sparks your interest, please register your interest with Leanne and we'll move forward into the future. This is our captive breeding program. So in answer to that question, we've actually got two captive breeding programs running at the same time. We've got an on-site one at Edge Bastion where we've built some semi-natural, what we call artificial springs. Um, and we breed them on site at Edge Baston Reserve. But we've also got some populations that are kept by the Australian Guinea Fishers Association in Brisbane, which are more of an insurance population if there's a local catastrophe that befalls central Queensland, that we've got a safe reservoir of fish in those tubs in Brisbane that we can utilise to reintroduce back into the wild if we need to. But um, Rob Wager designed and initially put in the artificial springs. They're basically a poly tank that's um, buried into the ground. There's some holes drilled around the outside so that the overflow from the bore inflow leaks out into what's gonna create a sort of semi-natural spring environment surrounding the tub. The tub's more of a drought refuge and there's a water level sensor that if it goes below 20 centimetres, I get an immediate message to say, get onto your water supply issue immediately, you've got a problem. So we know the fish is safe. But where volunteers have been engaged is we use the IRUs and other volunteers to plant vegetation into our artificial springs to sort of create that semi-natural environment. And then we've used volunteers ever since to pull that vegetation back out because it's extremely hard to manage. And there's Steph again. I found it, uncovered that one in the file, Steph, of Steph spending some time out at Edge Bastion trying to pull some kambungi out. And pretty much every volunteer I've got on reserve since has spent just a little bit of time pulling kambungi out of the artificial springs. The second opportunity for engagement is what I need to develop is a more refined way of monitoring fish. What we've used in the past is called the census approach. And basically what that means is you walk around the spring for 20 minutes and count the number of schools of fish you see and estimate the number of individuals in each school, but only the adults, not the juveniles. It's extremely hard and it's very imprecise. And to be honest, I think it's garbage. All we can say is, yeah, there's lots of fish or no, there's only a few fish or no, I'm pretty confident there's no fish there. And we need something better than that moving forward. So what, I'm, what I do, well, I've run a couple of trips where we've used volunteers to test a couple of more robust monitoring strategies. Um, we've got Paul Flint there with a simple Coke bottle bottle trap that we put in a spring for 20 minutes to see how effective it was at catching Gambusia. Obviously it's a very effective method. Um, I have Craig and Sally and Simone in the other picture, squatting down in the spring for 20 minutes, trying to identify Gambusia in a residual pool. So I'm basically testing different strategies to monitor fish to come up with one that's um, possible to get volunteers to help me with, that you don't need to be a fisheries expert to apply, but gives me a pretty good estimate of what the population is doing so I can track changes through time. Uh, and I'll be playing around with that for the next year or so. And volunteers that turn up to help at Edge Bastion will most likely be asking to, me, to assist me in some component of this through time. <laughs> uh, the next one is about our invertebrate survey. So this goes back to the second question that was raised in the chat. And that is what impact does the, this really extreme um, stress event have on the spring invertebrates. So before we started doing it, Adam Carezzi had run a lot of laboratory trials on the sensitivity of the snails and the shrimps to the rote moon concentration that we were using, but nobody's assessed what the overall impact is of the full activity of the fire, of the, the slashing, of the draining, of the, the poisoning. So we've built that into the current project. So it's actually a really enjoyable, but hard exercise. You collect core samples from 10 random locations within the spring. In our field laboratory, you then uh, rinse those samples to get rid of the mud and the excess vegetation so that you're left with a tennis ball sized clump of material that you then take back to the lab, put in a processing tray, put on your headlamp and pick through every snail and worm and shrimp that you can find in that sample. And there's Stephanie again, very busily picking macroinvertebrates out of a tray. You'd be interested to know that we've just appointed Renee Rossini, who did her PhD on the endemic fauna or invertebrate fauna of Edge Baston Reserve to help me out for the next 12 months. 
So Renee will sort of lead that um, invertebrate analysis from now on. But again, there's heaps of opportunities for helping out with those invertebrate surveys for the next year. The next one are our basic spring audits. So once a year, we travel around every spring on the reserve and catalogue their condition, how much pig damage there are, what was, is there a weed outbreak? Are the springs still active? Have they gone extinct? What are the endemic plants and animals that are present there? Uh, that's an opportunity to drive all around the reserve, well, not all around the reserve, at least all around the springs woodlands and the springs area of the reserve. Um, a lot of hiking, a lot of G GPS use to find the springs in the first place. On the last catalogue, I think we had 215 springs on the reserve, which is up from about 100 that they knew about when Bush Heritage bought the property. We've got fauna and flora monitoring that happens every year. There's only limited scope for volunteer support for this one, sorry guys, but there are opportunities if you're very good at plant ID or bird watching, that there's probably scope to get you to help out with um, fauna monitoring, which happens in March. Um, and as I said, that's an annual thing moving forward. We rely on the Conservation Wildlife Management Group of the Sporting Suitors Association, who volunteer their time to help us control feral animals on the reserve. Uh, really, I'd li like to keep it with that relationship. So if you're interested in hunting on the reserve, you do it by joining the Sporting Suitors Association and their Conservation Wildlife Group and come out to the reserve. They spend a few weeks each year um, targeting pigs for us, but while they're there, but sometimes they also set cat traps and shoot whatever rabbits they encounter. And that's been a really successful program because the first couple of years they were doing it, we got 100 odd pigs in the first year, and now we only get a few individuals per year. So that pig population on the reserve really has been suppressed, and it's all been because of the Sporting Shooters Association. And the last one is our um, growing behemoth of a problem of woody weeds. We've got massive infestations of prickly acacia along our fence, fence uh, not fence lines, creek lines, and Parkinsonia infestations in our lake bed of Lake Muir. So there's some scope to actually get in with weed spraying, but what we really need assistance with is helping us to map where the dense patches of weeds are so that we can send contractors in with heavy machinery to deal with it cost effectively. And that's something that we'll be uh, engaging a lot more support from over the next 12 month period. So if any of those things interest you, there's Leanne doing her bit to control captive breeding, uh, the weeds around our captive breeding springs. Uh, please get in contact with Leanne. She knows what I need. She knows the kind of people I like to work with and she'll be more than accommodating to try and find you an opportunity where you can come and help out at Edge Baston. And look how much I'm smiling in that photo. I'm obviously having a ball. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Thank so you, that, Dean. That's it, for, that's it for my presentation. If we've got some questions, I'll them now. That's fantastic. Um, just for the, the benefit of those of you that might be watching this on the recording later, um, there was a question earlier from James about the access to the springs by native animals as a water source. Um, and Leanne answered that one about that only a fraction of the reserve's <coughs> surface water is inside those fenced areas. So there yes. is still plenty of other water abundant for those macropods to get to. Yep, and the, the fences are only um, 40 centimetres high. So most animals can just step over, literally step over. Uh, and those that can't step over can climb because it's climb. Mm. Uh, The benefit of the spring, we've also found that cane toads generally are excluded by the spring fences as well, which is a secondary benefit. Um, we've got a, a question from Peter about the sustainability of the program without active human intervention. So is there ever going to be a point where we can step away from this and it can be self-sustainable? Uh, not in the near future. There is a biocontrol program um, that's called Trojan Y, which is a genetic biocontrol um, that skews the sex of Gambusia populations. And Bush Heritage is committed to a partnership with the University of Tasmania who are developing the technology. There's a YouTube, um, what is it called? A TED Talk clip that you can watch about where they're at. Um, the university will be submitting an arc linkage application soon and we're going to be supporting as an industry partner. That might open up, open up an opportunity for a long-term biocontrol for Gambusia, which would be great. But short of a great Gambusia wall at our reserve boundary, it's very unlikely that redfin blue eye would persist if we weren't there um, managing the incursions and making sure our fences are intact. 
And um, we've got another question from James as well about the movement of the invasive uh, fish. Can they only move through in, the, in a flood situation? So if you remove them from a spring, is that the only way they can come back to that spring? Yes, so they can't fly. There are theories about range of fishes in inland Australia. Uh, I won't rule out the possibility that that may occur, but it's a really, really rare occurrence. But Gambusia are recognised as an intensely capable invader. They've literally been recorded swimming tens of kilometres up wet wheel ruts. Um, and at Edge Bastion, if we get more than about 25 millimetres of rain in a 24 hour period, they can literally swim over land to move between springs. But what we are doing is we've also got a grant from WIRES to map the hydrology and the connections between each spring on the reserve to really high resolution, like centimetre scale resolution. So we can identify the parts of the reserves that Cambridge can't get into uh, and focus on recovery in those parts, or rather than put a ring fence around every individual spring, we can build one block fence that will protect an entire cluster of springs on the reserve without inhabiting access for any other organisms other than Gambusia. So they're sort of the end goals we want to work towards, but unfortunately we're not there yet, but that's where we want to go. Yeah, fantastic. Um, and last question is, do you know the status of the gene pool that you've got for the blue eye? Okay, yes, um, we've got a very intensive genetic monitoring program. All of the genetic variation that exists for the species exists in that single remnant population in type locality. So really it's, it needs to be wrapped in cotton wool and protected at all costs, because if we lose that one population, we've lost a huge proportion of the genetic diversity that exists. One of the management plan targets is to create a second genetically diverse population. We're trying to achieve that, but we're not there yet. Uh, generally, the genetic results we've got to date suggest that when we found a new population, we need to get representative genetic material from all of the other available populations and mix it together to found our new populations. Um, but you can rest assured, I actually did my PhD on conservation genetics and that's kind of my field of expertise and I'm going to make sure I stay on top of the genetic stuff. Yeah, fantastic. Oh, thanks so much for that, Dean. Um, it was really interesting to hear about. Um, some of you may have seen the, the news articles that we had of the translocations last year. So it's really interesting to get some of the follow-up work that's happening on it this year. Um, Dean's got to jump into another meeting, but if there's any other questions, uh, please feel free to put them in the chat or to send them through to us and we'll follow up with Dean afterwards. So thank you so much, Dean. No, thank you. Sorry, I went over time. Great. Thanks, <laughs> Dean. See ya. All right, um, our next speaker is Tegan Hibberson. So Tegan is the Program Officer for Science and Conservation, and she's gonna be talking a bit about some of the climate adaptation research that we have been doing today. Tegan, hello. Hello, everyone. Um, Katie, could you please let, let me share my screen? Yes, let me give you Thank you. Advice. But hello, everyone. Lovely to see some faces and nice to meet lots of you. My as Kay said, my name is Tegan Hibberson. I'm the Science Project Manager for Bush Heritage and I work in our science and conservation team, which is really around um, strategies and I work with lots of different researchers to help us make the most informed decisions we can around all of our management opportunities. So I'm just going to go. Should work for you now. Can you all see that fine? How's that, everyone? Yep, perfect. Beautiful. All right, so I just want to acknowledge firstly that I'm calling in from what was, always, will be Wurundjeri country, and I want to pay my respects to their elders past, present, and recognise that wherever we stand in Australia, we're standing on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander land. Um, so this project is around the, the climate futures work, which has been a huge piece of work, which I just want to pay recognition to my predecessor, Kate Fitz. Herbert, who lots of you might have worked with, this was a project she started and I've inherited from her. So I might assume a little bit of knowledge here, so I apologise, but generally Bush Heritage works in our priority landscapes. We've got 19 priority landscapes across the country that we've deemed as where we really need to focus our work and where Bush Heritage can have the most impact. 
So in the image here, you can see all of the priority landscapes. And this project is looking at what does the future climate look like and what are going to be the implications of climate change on all the prairie landscapes across the country. So just a small project. Um, it's been an absolute mammoth piece of work and just we've got huge numbers of volunteers that have been helping with us with this for a couple of years. Lots of student placements. It's been a great team effort. But the whole project has really been pulled down into about four steps. So I'm just going to let you know. So it's about understanding climate change and what implications that's going to have across the country. It's around understanding how those changes are going to impact all of our vegetation and their extent and their functionality. It's then also looking at individual species and how they're going to be affected and then providing potentially new and innovative management solutions or maybe even just reprioritizing some of our current management strategies. So it's broad and it's pretty bold. Sorry, I can't see anyone's faces, so I apologize if I'm, if I'm going too fast. Just Katie, shout out and, and let me know. So this was a huge collaboration that came from the start working with CSIRO. They publicly released all of their climate change modeling and they did lots of education with us and a few other not-for-profit NGOs and other people in the sector to really teach us how to use this amazing data set. So we did lots of work with them through their website, Climate, Climate Change in Australia, and that really showed us the projections. That showed us what's likely to happen over this new century, over into really, you know, 2009, into the late century. And then the next step, once we know that, we then actually had some incredible mapping work done by one of my colleagues, Colin Broughton. And he's been able to map all of this amazing amount of work and show us what that looks like. How is the suitability for vegetation going to change? What's the extent like? How's that changed from what we knew in 1990? And what's that gonna look like in, in 2050? Um, Next piece, and this is the main piece of work that we've had a huge amount of volunteers working on, and you might have all seen that email that Katie sent around recently advertising for more people to, to join us. And this is really focusing in on this step three. It's doing thorough, intensive literature reviews of all of our targets. So we define what we care about, so we might say it's a squirrel glider in this area of Australia, maybe it's certain ecological communities, as Dean was saying, you know, it's redfin blue eye, it's those springs, it's the Mitchell grass in, in his priority landscape. So, so me and my team, we're going, all right, exactly what is it about those targets that might make them resilient or might make them vulnerable to all that information that we learned in steps one and two? And then once we've kind of got our heads around this, through the research, we're getting lots of different strategies around how we might deal with all of this information. And we're trying to put all of that information together with a bit of solution oriented focus. Um, so I've just got this here as a little bit of, so you, so for a little bit of context. So I apologize, I'm quite, well known for being pretty horrendous with my acronyms. So I will do my best to avoid them, but here's a little scenario. So I regularly say RCPs and it's our representative concentration pathways and how much emissions are actually in the atmosphere. So what we've done, if we have tracked three emission scenarios over the three different time scales, so 2030, 2040 and 2060, so for each of our landscapes, it means we have nine climate scenario, potential scenarios that tell us what's going on or what is expected to happen. <coughs> and this is some of the information that we can get out. So this is an example that we got from Nullarwar country in our southeast New South Wales priority landscape. 
And this just shows some of the information that comes out of that work um, and being very clear around what the kind of consensus modeling is saying. So we're looking at huge numbers, hundreds of data sets. So it's trying to tell us where the most amount of consensus is, where, where's the regularity and the consistency do we have, or is it really varied? And therefore we've got very low consensus. So we would say we have quite low confidence in these projections and that varies across the country's um, country and even in temperature and rainfall the consensus can vary and this is just showing some of that information how we what we expect and this is just showing where that information comes from from the CSIRO they've got analog towns we call them analog points um, set all around the country and this is where they pull all of their amazing data and past data and it feeds into their bomb website and it's an incredible incredible resource they've made available publicly and, and really worked with us to share so this is this is what we were going through step two of the analysis we've just done our projections and this is back into step two so southeast new south wales is, is what i'm going to go through for a whole worked example for you so you can see how much work goes into that. So how much just incredible expertise, time, dedication we've had from, from everyone that's been involved in this program. It has been really amazing. And some of the outcomes we're getting have, are really going to be quite transformative through, through time at the moment. Um, so what we're looking at here is what's going to happen? Where is the greatest change going to happen? in that landscape where where are the areas we really need to um how the woodlands and the open forest how is that all expected to change what are those traits that make them really vulnerable or really resilient to the expectations and then what does that actually mean for our squirrel glider which is our target they're the there's what we've decided we really care about and all of this stuff is so interconnected, you can't look at one without the other. So that's why we're always taking that very broad approach, broad approach into woodlands refugia and then down into species. So we're really trying to get a whole understanding. And this is one of the, the maps that was created through this project, looking at lots of data. So this shows us the potential degree of ecological change. how that's going to affect these four different groups. So we can see the darker the colour, the higher the change, and the lighter the colour, the lower the change. So we can see for mammals, it's, it's relatively low change. We're going to expect for vascular plants, especially around this section of the landscape, and we've got our colour reserve here, that we do have a relatively high change expected for that landscape. And then this is also one of those layers where we look at refugial potential. So this is pulling all of those information, climate, geographical, all together to tell us what are the areas that through time are going to be persistent, really good strongholds. So we can see here that southeast for our amphibians and for our vascular plants, just to the south of our priority landscape maintain some really good refugia. So we need to make sure that we're looking after all of this and anything that kind of packs onto that. But there's potentially less refugia potential, which maybe we then might need to put some artificial in. We might need to just kind of re-strategize how we look after amphibians in this top section of the priority landscape. It's just a way to provide us information to make a really good informed decision. And then this is one of the um, National Vegetation Index systems. So it's a national vegetation um, categorizing system and they've gone through and mapped it and they've said, okay, what did it used to look like? What's the, did it, this was its previous extent in 1990 where it was projected to be suitable. And this is its changing suitability in the year 2050. 
so you can see that it's actually becoming more suitable for you looking with a shrubby understory and it's encroaching higher, especially up here but in the southeast. It's all becoming suitable, slightly more suitable. And then this is another example of a similar kind of map that just shows us that information that we need. And then this is that third step. So this is the bulk of the work that our amazing volunteers have been helping on this project with. And it's taking that information and then hitting the books and literally and figuratively in every sense of the word, um, doing big literature reviews on all of our known information for these species. Oh, sorry, one too far. So for our eucalypt woodland community, white box, yellow box, and Blakely's red gum, which is uh, one of our targets for the Southeast New South Wales, we've that said that climate change is likely to alter the extent, structure, and composition of those woodlands. Um, and we've said that because we know attributes that make this community vulnerable the fact that it prefers cooler winter rain dominated climates, productive soils, and therefore it's regularly threatened by increasing urbanization and agriculture. Seedling recruitment is low in heavy rainfall years, and then it's also a significant threat from extent of land clearing, logging, fragmentation, degradation, and then natural fire regimes as well. So we know that that's what's going to make this community susceptible and vulnerable to the climate changing climate. But then on the other hand, we're also looking at what makes resilient. So we're looking for range. So it can move around and it can tolerate different altitudinal ranges. Um, pretty resilient to fire. We can reshoot from lignatures at the Cormac Cruise. So if we're pulling in cooler climates and doing more cultural burns, then, then there's a way to make it to make it slightly more resilient and then it also depending on the fire frequency and intensity it can liberate resources and open up spaces for different recruitment so it's always a challenge to to present this but this project as i said before is around presenting the information to all of our regional staff who have that incredibly detailed and long understanding of these places, of these landscapes, of these reserves, of these species. And this is just presenting them the information so that they can use it how they need to, to manage their reserves and their landscapes. And then the squirrel glider, which lives in these eucalypt forests, we've then that done the similar assessments for them. And we've said he's gonna be pretty fair. He's not gonna to be too implicated by climate change because he's vulnerable. Like all gliders, they generally like old growth. Um, they use hollow bearing trees as their den sites. And these species also use multiple trees for, for denning. They have low recruitment, so one to two per litter. And then the threats is their loss of their habitat. And we know with extended drought, some of their, those those trees are likely to be susceptible to die back as we've seen across large parts of Australia and are restricted to those large trees, which are generally found along those roadside vegetation. But then he's also pretty resilient because he'll inhabit a broad range of vegetation types. Their diet's pretty broad and they'll also be very dependent on the food availability when, they're, when they can breed. So, Again, lots of compounding things going on here, but the amount of work that has gone into this is spreadsheets that are, I haven't even been able to download some of them. I've had to go into the office and go onto like the supercomputer to download them because the, the information in here is, is enormous and it just shows how deep all of this research has been done through all known literature, lots of government websites, all the information that we, we can find. And then out of all of that, we're gonna, these are some of the management options to consider. And you can see some of them, they're, they're, they're pretty logical. Like there probably isn't 
a huge amount in there that, that's going to really surprise anyone. But in other areas which are maybe going to be hit a little bit harder with climate change, we might be presenting some more kind of innovative trialling solutions to come up just to, to make sure we're really on the forefront of all of this work to make sure we're, we're doing everything we can in the face of in the face of such an uncertain future but mm -hmm. I think this is a really really great project in the sense that we now have a way to move forward so I know I just want to acknowledge the State of Environment report. Lots of you probably would have seen that that came out and that was quite hard to read a lot of it. It was quite distressing. And when we are, when I'm talking about climate change, this is something I spend a lot of my time looking at. It can get really hard and I want to recognise that, you know, we all love this space. That's why you, you spend so much of your time volunteering. That's why we work in this space because we absolutely love the bush and love country. Um, and this means that we have ways to manage it and to really look after it and have the best available knowledge and all the best minds working on solutions because we can't fix what we don't know. But if we've got all this information in hand, we're then able to, to move forward and develop solutions. So what we're starting to do now, so we've finished a few of these kind of landscape research projects and analysis and now we're starting to to trial putting it into management plans and seeing where all this information needs to sit how we're going to share this information with not only the team but all the other stakeholders especially the traditional owners and and again recognizing that we're going to be presenting some pretty hard information and we're trying to work through a way to do that in a way that's very culturally safe and appropriate, especially when we're talking through potential totem species. Uh, we might be re some of this information might go, okay, we need to reassess some of our targets. Maybe we need to have a bit of a rethink because something might be in a bit more trouble than we realised. So maybe we need to just go back through our conservation planning process. Review all said, Sometimes we're just going to need to allow ecosystem transformation. We don't need to get involved. But sometimes maybe we just need to get them through to allow for evolution to take over. And then sometimes it might need more intervention in different scenarios. And we're also setting in ways to set up different kind of climate surveillance monitoring methods so that we can look at what's happening as it's, as it's happening and then make decisions and have actions matched with those decision-making kind of trigger points that are coming out through this research. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Tegan. Um, I went that through was, that. <laughs> that was fantastic. Um, I've seen a little bit of, and I've seen a little bit of what you guys have been working on to get a bit more information. Has been, um, yeah, really informative. Um, if there's any questions, uh, chuck them through in the chat, put them through in the chat and I'll chuck them. That's very terrible English of me. Um, or feel free to come off mute to ask Tegan a question. Um, while, you're, while you guys are thinking or while you're putting some questions in there, um, is there any research happening around like natural recruitment and natural migration of species and how that might just happen, at, as you said, just naturally, natural evolution? Yeah, absolutely. So that all kind of, how species and ecosystems are recruiting now and you can you can probably see from past events and species distribution models how they might have adapted or changed to past scenarios um, so that provides a lot of information which we're actually able to use for this climate futures work and then we're trying to replicate some of that but that gets into potential translocations and things which obviously is a very big undertaking which is out of the scope for this project we're just trying to say you know, um, for certain species, this is what we're thinking, how they might react, respond, and this is what we think we might need to do. But there's a lot of learnings to take from all of that, but that's probably out of scope for, for the next stage. That'll all be very reserve specific work. Yeah, yep, definitely. Um, and yes, David, to answer your question, that is the report that the previous government did hold back and not release <laughs> and let the new government release it. <laughs> yes, you're right. <laughs> 
Um, we've got a question here. Was there any focus on insects as they're 80% of the animal species and the foods to so many vertebrates? Yeah, good question. Actually, not today. And I think that's pretty indicative of the fact that there generally isn't a lot of research done on invertebrates and that's, you know, worldwide. Um, and it's one of those things where if we were to go through it, they're not defined as our key target. So that's what this work's based on. So at Bush Heritage, we use the open standards for conservation as our framework. So it's a worldwide framework that lots of different organisations use. And at the very start of that, when we're looking at it, landscape or new properties we care about and that's what this work has really been based on so today there isn't any targets which are invertebrate specific um, so I haven't based any of the work for this project on that but if there was then we would um, but I think that just comes down to the, the knowledge and the fact that unfortunately a lot of a lot of those guys are a bit data deficient which I think just means we need to get some more research started really because I think it's part of that we don't know Know what we don't know until yeah. we do a little bit we won't we won't know <laughs> the loops getting those national standards in or the open standards in so anyone who is interested in those um thank you very much for that tegan i don't think i'm just having a quick look in the chat making sure i haven't missed any questions doesn't look like it. Um, are we able to get a, a copy of that presentation? We can, there's quite a lot of data in there that many of you might want to have a closer look through and that might prompt some questions. Um, but if you, yeah, if you come up with anything that you'd like answered or you want to get a bit of clarification, just send it through to us, uh, the volunteer team, and we can forward it on to Tegan or to Dean as well. So thank you so much, Tegan, for that. Uh, and thank you everyone for coming along today. Um, we'd like to run, if you want to, you're still sharing your screen, Tegan. Oh, sorry. Sorry about that. That's all right. We can see how busy your emails are. Oh, if you don't want to see that, that scares everybody away. There you go. better for the moment. Um, we are looking to have these talks um, at least twice a year. We, we know that we... Uh, we want to still have face-to-face -face gatherings where we can. We're going to try and organise some of those over the next six to 12 months across some of the capital cities. Um, but while we are arranging the logistics of those, we want to still be continuing to have these virtual catch-ups uh, at least twice a year, especially for those of you that might not be near capital cities as well. So thank you so much. Um, if you've got any feedback or any questions, please send them through to me. I'm always looking at ways that I can improve these talks, make them bigger and better and different. If there's any particular topics you'd like to hear about, um, if you hear about any work that we're working on or you're on reserve and you're talking to staff and you're really interested to find out more and you'd like that to be part of a presentation in the future, um, please re reach out and let us know. Um, but thank you, everyone. Stay safe and we will see you all at the next one. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.